just finished uh, the new year and we are in 2017, 2017. So I'm going to get Caroline to read the basic text for today's message. Genesis 37, verses 2 to 5. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Amen. God bless you, the sharing of your word. Joseph being 17 years old, I want you to know that's significant for us. We are in 20. 17. Remember, we've laid a lot of emphasis on 17. Joseph, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding his flock. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. You know, oftentimes, God meets us at a particular time in our life. And if you look at your life too, you will find that it is, I, I know in my life, it is... 16, 17, 18, 19, that time. David, what time? When did God meet David? When he was 16 years old in the desert. The Bible says that he wrote the 23rd Psalm. I mean, theologians tell us when he was 23. So there is a time when God comes. And it seems to be when you reach adolescence or when you reach the 17, 18, 19. So this time, Joseph is introduced. He's introduced to us when he is 17 years old. And that is found in Genesis 37. This is the first time Joseph has been mentioned. But why does God put Joseph in the scriptures? Why does God put Jacob in the scriptures? You must understand that he is trying to tell something about Jesus Christ. He's always, you know, Steve Chocolati says that, that everything in the Old Testament is a revelation of Christ. T.D. Jake says that everything in the Old Testament or most of the things in the Old Testament is to reveal Christ, the message of salvation, the Father heart of God. So does Joseph Prince. So all these ministers keep saying the Old Testament, they call it typology. Typology means it's a type of Christ, a precursor. It's something that God is trying to tell you from the time the uh, Old Testament is written. I got the definition of typology for you. It says this, Typology is a method of biblical interpretation whereby an element is found in the Old Testament is seen to prefigure one found in the New Testament. A precursor, a person, a thing or event. It's a precursor. That means it's something that's going to happen in the New Testament. It's being revealed in the Old. It's about Jesus and salvation. So I want you to look as, as you study the life of Joseph. Just think at that time what God was revealing to his people. I suggest to you Joseph is a type of Jesus. Joseph is a type of Jesus. Jacob loved Joseph so much more. He was the beloved of Jacob. Jo uh, jo Joseph was the beloved. The his father just loved him so much. Do you see the similarity with Jesus? Jesus was his, the beloved of his father too. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says this, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Suddenly, the heavens opened, and he saw a Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Joseph's brothers hated him. Joseph's kinfolk, Joseph's people hated him. And it says when Joseph had a dream, they hated him even more. I just want to pause and say this. It is strange when you have a dream or you have a vision or you have favor from God, the resistance or the attack oftentimes comes 
from your family. It is sad, but in Joseph's case, it is true. In David's case, it is true. Who are you, David? I know the naughtiness of your heart. Who did you leave that little sheep with? These are his brothers saying. In Joseph's case, these are his brothers who, who hate Joseph. In fact, they cannot speak peacefully with him. There is this antagonistic, the angry feeling. When God gives you a gift, when God gives you a dream, a vision, a position or a promotion, those closest to you, like family members, relatives, may hate you for it. They may be jealous, they may be envious. They will try and destroy you. In fact, I'm quoting T.D. Jakes. They will try and destroy you or discredit you. They see the favour of God, the gifts and position in your life, etc. as a challenge to them. As a challenge to them. Putting you down, they believe, puts you up. I just say that so that you understand what's going on in the background. Because the favour of God may attract these things. Bear that in mind. I'm not talking about the favour of man. That's a different ballgame. The favour of God, because there are spiritual forces at work. So they will try their level best. You find that Joseph went to prison. In Genesis 39 verse 22, you know he was sold to slavery and whatnot. I just want to do the similarity with Jesus Christ. But the Lord was with Joseph. They said he went to prison, but the Lord was with Joseph. And extended love to him. You're sending a man to prison. He's going to be isolated. He's going to lose his freedom. But the Lord is with him and loves him. The Lord loves him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed Joseph charge of all the prisoners. So he became in charge. He was put in charge of all the prisoners and he became responsible. That's what the scripture says. I quote verbatim. Joseph's charge, uh, the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. He was responsible. Any similarity with Jesus? 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 and 19 For Christ also suffered for the sins once and for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit in which he also went to preach to the spirits in the prison. Christ too went to the prison to preach to the prison. Joseph too went to prison and he preached in the prison. He was in charge and he shared what he knew. Joseph, like Jesus, became what God intended them to be. You will be what God intended you to be, despite your ups and downs. If you look at Joseph's life carefully, you will find that many years has passed from 17. So many things that happened, I will allude to it later. So many things happened, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he becomes Prime Minister of Egypt. And when I was in Singapore last night, I was thinking of the message. You know, you can't get the message out of your head. And the Spirit of God dropped this into my heart because I was with Deva Mani and Vigneshwaran. Vigneshwaran is the Speaker of Parliament and Deva Mani is the Senator. And I was telling God, wow, all these powerful people, Alba was there, a lot of, a lot of powerful people were there. And uh, I was telling God, you know, a lot of powerful people that can impact and change this country. You know, and then I'm saying, how do I connect? How do I make an impact in the lives of the people in Malaysia. How, how do I use my life to be a blessing apart from uh, going through battle and all that? And the Lord did this to me and I believe He wanted me to share it with you. He told me, you're sharing about Joseph tomorrow. I said, I'm sharing about Joseph. And He said, how do you think Joseph felt when he was in prison? I said, he felt forgotten. He felt it was all over. Story over. There's no way I'm going to make an impact. There's no way I'm going to change this nation. There's no way I'm going to contribute significantly. He just felt lost. It's over. It's over. But you remember what Joseph did not stop doing? I said, what Lord? He didn't stop practicing the gift I've given him. He kept interpreting dreams. He kept blessing the people. He kept doing what God had put in his heart. He was faithful. 
And overnight, without any connection with any minister, without any connection with any top powerful people, God made him prime minister. God said, nothing is too difficult for me. So I want you to know this, you don't need connections. You don't need networks. You don't need, you know, I must get to know so and so. You don't need that. The truth is this, you can be in the worst position. You can be a foreigner and a slave and a criminal in a country and you can end up prime minister the next day if God is on your side. If your mind is focused on God, if your eyes is focused on God. That's all it took for David. That's all it took for David. He was in the desert looking after sheep and carried on the mundane days, on and on. And suddenly Goliath appears and he was not even in battle gear. He was not supposed to fight. And suddenly he takes on Goliath and he's propelled into the international arena. It's an overnight thing. It's not a gradual thing. I always think that gradually you pass, then you go to the next step and you go. With God, He is training you. The more tedious the training, the greater the destiny. The more difficult the life, the greater the calling. Bear that in mind. Bear that in mind. Okay. Joseph is mentioned in the scripture 272 times in over 20 books of the Bible. Joseph, we know, was the son of Rachel. We know that Joseph, I mean, Jacob loved Joseph because the Bible says he's the son of his old age. But the first time we introduce Joseph, the first line, it says Joseph brought a bad report. Joseph brought an evil report to Jacob. I want you to know how special Joseph was. Joseph, like David and Daniel, is given a special place in Scripture. It's not by accident he's mentioned so many times. But I want you to know, Joseph did not write a book. David did. He wrote practically the whole Psalms. You know, Daniel did. But Joseph didn't write any book. It is written about him. It is written about him. But the difference between Joseph and the rest is, Joseph saved the world. In his time, the world was going through famine. It was going to be in a, in a terrible state. But somehow, whatever Joseph did, the interpretation he gave Pharaoh, and he was put in charge, he managed to save the world from famine. Somebody else too came and saved the world from sin and death. That's Jesus Christ. You know, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. So you keep seeing the parallels. So as I go along, I may not mention them, but let it resonate in you. Let it resonate in you. But what's so special, apart from being mentioned 272 times and 20 over books? Another thing that makes Joseph really special, if you look at the tribes of Israel, there are 12 tribes, you know that, right? 12 tribes. But Joseph is not one of the tribes. Joseph's name is not mentioned as a tribe. Every other brother or every other son of Jacob has a tribe, Judah, Benjamin, Natalie, every one of them, Reuben. But Joseph actually has described two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. Both his sons become tribes. So under him, there are two tribes. So he's blessed twice. Every other person has got one tribe. Tremendous, huh? the double anointing. But I want to know why. God, are you indiscriminate with your love? That means, uh, are you fair? Or is there favoritism? Are you choosing Joseph because hey, it's something special from the time you you know from time immemorable you liked him you put him there everything is fated, or was there something special about Joseph that Jacob loved? Jacob loved Joseph, so I put there because he was Rachel. Jacob, Jacob loved Rachel, and uh, he was a son of the old age, so it could be those reasons. But I want to suggest the main reason, the main reason. Jacob loved Joseph was because Joseph was righteous. Joseph was a righteous man. Where do you see Joseph right? 17 years old, he is bringing a bad report to Jacob. We do not know what the bad report is. The Bible is silent. But we know it will be something that will upset Jacob. Jacob is the patriarch. Jacob is the authority. Jacob is the leader. The brothers, maybe him too, were doing something mischievous. 
something that will offend Jacob, something that will upset Jacob. So Joseph had a choice. He could keep quiet. He could go along. He could close an eye, say, I should, it's not my business. Or he could take the report to his father. But you can see at 17 the kind of man he is. I'm not going to let my father suffer. I love my father. I am here to protect my father's interests. So I'm going to tell my father. I'm not going to let my brothers continue in this way of life. It is wrong what they're doing. And I want my father to get involved so he will correct the wrong that is being done. So the four things that I put here that Joseph didn't do. He did not hide things from the authority above him like his father. He spoke against evil. If something was wrong, he wanted to right the wrong. He reported, and this is important, he reported to his father knowing the consequences at the expense of his popularity. You know, we want to be popular. We don't want to offend people. We also want to live in peace. So you report on somebody, you know, they will, they will hate you. And he got hated, by the way, because he reported. But he nevertheless did it. He did it. He reported at the expense of his comfort. And I even put here personal security. Because when you report, the person you report against will be very upset with you. And in Joseph's case, they were so upset that they attempted to kill him. In fact, for all intents and purposes, they killed him. But he still reported. You look at the man. Joseph is like that. He speaks. You know, we learn that in Jesus' life also, Jesus' life also, he had the similar issue. He came to his own, but his own received him not. He came to do what is right, but the own did not receive him. The scripture says, he went into his father's house. There he saw things that were not right being done there. He saw, oh, how can you, money changers, do this? How can you trade? And he overturned, but at the risk of the Pharisees going after him, at the risk of offending. But he said, no, I stand for what is right. I stand for what is true. I stand for what is righteous. When they started throwing stones at those who were caught in adultery or caught in any type of sin, Jesus stood up and said, you cannot. He who has not sinned, cast the first stone. Hey, you offend me. You know, I'm the elder brother. We are the Pharisees. We are your leaders. You should just kept quiet and let us stone. Jesus said, no, I will stand up for the oppressed, the downtrodden. I will do justice. I will love mercy. I will walk humbly before you. And what happened to Jesus? He was sold and later, crucified. He was sold by Judas, then handed over to Pontius Pilate, the Roman, the Gentiles, and later crucified. What happened to Joseph? He was sold for 20 pieces. Jesus was sold for 30, maybe inflation. You know, so <laughs> Jesus was sold for 30, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Joseph was sold to the Mennonites, Jesus was sent to the uh, Romans. So you see this similarity, both paid the price. Both paid the price. Jesus said, you shall not turn my father's house into a den of thieves. Very powerful word. You hypocrites, you brood of vipers, who has warned you? He speaks the truth. Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Joseph exhibited these qualities at a very young age. And I'm suggesting that one of the reasons that Jacob loved him. Jacob knew Joseph is protecting my interests. God knew Jesus was doing the will of God. Joseph was doing the will of Jacob. And Jesus was doing the will of his God. Do you speak up for what is right and true? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Do you report when you find something wrong being done? I give you the first example. Do you report to the authority in the home? There is an authority in every home. God placed it such. There is a chief priest. He is. The Bible says that very clearly. A chief priest in the home. And he's oftentimes the father in the house. 
the, the leading male figure. Do you report when there is something wrong? When there is something that will upset, you know will upset him. There is something, he wants to run things in a particular way. I want you to know Joseph was the kind of person who will report. I want to slip in here a warning which I believe is from God. Oftentimes, women with the best of intentions adopt the spirit of Jezebel and they undermine the chief priests in the house. Be careful when you take that route. Do not undermine the chief priests in the house. Jezebel did that to Ahab. Jezebel did that to Ahab. Every time Ahab wanted to do something or do, she will plan. She will. I will do it with my prophets. I will get. Ahab, I will get Elijah. Don't do that because the fate of Jezebel eventually was disastrous. So women, be careful. Always remember that you have covering and protection when you come under that authority. So report and argue your case. That's my my. Uh, suggestion to you, whoever. You may find that the chief priest may be a bit uh, unreasonable or difficult to deal with, but you have to report and then argue, argue your point and convince the chief priest to take a particular position. But not reporting is not an option. Not reporting is not of God. So take it up if it is something that uh, will upset him or something that, that you know he should know. If you're a boss in a firm or you belong in an office, or a firm, and there is a senior partner or boss, you have an obligation to bring it up to his attention. Somebody has taken money, oh, I don't want to get involved, I did not. You have a duty. Joseph was like that. We have an obligation. We have no choice. If you are a managing director in a company, and, and the employees, employees have a duty, all the other directors have a duty to tell the managing director, it doesn't change. It's the same in a church. When there's a problem in a church, a member says something about another member, there is a problem, or oh, don't tell the pastor. That is not of God. The first person you should tell is the pastor. I want to rec- I encourage you, whichever church, whichever organization you belong, because then only the matter is solved. Then only the matter is resolved. Then the community stays intact. The family stays intact. But you find somebody else trying to lead a different way, another person trying to lead, chaos and disaster reigns. And Joseph stood for that. Joseph stood for what is right. And even though there were consequences, he did what is right. He became very unpopular. You may become very unpopular if you do that, in the firm, in the house, in the church. But I want to rest and tell you this. The story is not over. Because being right in God's eyes is better than being right in the eyes of the world. God doesn't forget you. God marks you. Then God begins to shower you with gifts and he puts a coat of many colors. He covers you. That's all you need. God has got you covered. You don't need man. You don't need the popularity of man. Many people, for the sake of what others think and do, they act in a particular way. I want to encourage you, for the sake of what God thinks, let us do. Let us do in accordance to what God thinks. Well, Joseph did not hide. He did not bury the report. He went to his earthly father and he told, this is the position. Then he found himself many years later in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife uh, made a, uh, uh, a play for him. Yeah, Made a play for him. But you look at what he said, I will not sin against God. Again, his mind was on God. I will not do something wrong against God. But before he said God, he also said, I will not sin against my master. He recognized the authority of his master. I cannot do anything wrong against my master. I cannot do anything wrong against the boss of the house. I cannot do anything wrong against the Lord. Because it goes hand in hand. The chief priest and the Lord God is hand in hand. You cannot divide the two. It is the same thing. So Joseph was very clear, his earthly father, his marketplace father, and the Lord God. He played that role. Remember, I shared with you the forefathers? Yeah. So you must remember that he always dealt fairly and righteously with everyone. So you see, wherever Joseph went, he dealt fairly 
and righteously. He developed that habit. So when he was in prison, and there were two dreams, and one dream was really bad, right? The crow came and took it. He knows the fellow's going to die. He could have uh, tailor made that answer to a different type of conclusion or say, maybe, you know, I will leave out some words. He was truthful. You're going to die. You're going to serve Pharaoh. <laughs> you see the distinction? He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. We mustn't be afraid to speak the truth. You know, I put here, <clears throat> sometimes keeping quiet, you think, I'm keeping quiet so I am exempted. But even in Malaysian law, in British law as well, you have what is called common intention. Common intention means you don't have to do the very act. So long as you're in the company of people who do the act, it is presumed that you intended the same consequence. Can it be that? You don't have to do the very act, but so long as you're in the company, the law presumes. So if the law, natural man can presume, how much more God? How much more God? Jacob knew this son loved him so much more than any other son. That's how Jacob knew. That's how God knows that you love him. When you stand up for what he believes in, when you do justice, when you love kindness, and you walk humbly before him. So doing justice is an integral part. It is not an option. It's a requirement. Loving kindness is integral to God. And walking humbly before him. So Jacob knew this son loves me because regardless of the consequence to his life, he is giving me a report. And I may scold him, I may correct him, but I know he loves me. And just Jacob must have taken whatever action. Because you see, after the next verse, just after the fact that they introduced Joseph, uh, brought the bread report, it says Jacob loved him more than any of his other sons. Does God have favorites? No. God does not have favorites. God favors those who make much of him. Get that? God favors those who make much of God. But God has no favorites. But if you want to look at a favorite, because you see David is taken care of by God, Joseph, Daniel, wow, God really takes care of these guys. It is because they make much of God. If you make much of God, God will favor you. You will become God's favorite. Okay, you will become God's favorite. Just like Jacob knew his son loved him so much more than any other son. Jacob, Jacob says in the next verse, uh, the Bible says that Joseph, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He who does the will of my father loves me. Not who gives lip service. So when we do God's will, when we act and protect the things that God wants to act and protect against, then we are loved. So now we know Joseph is loved. So much because the kind of person he is. And, and suddenly you find Jacob is drawn to this man. He loves this man. And the next verse tells us, this patriarch, Jacob, decides to stitch a robe of many colors, a tunic of many colors for Joseph. <clears throat> you must understand, it is very un uncommon. Or A patriarch doesn't become a tailor. Let me tell you, he's got so many tailors. He's got so many people to help him. He doesn't go stitch. But the scripture says Joseph stitched. Joseph, I mean, Jacob stitched uh, a cloth. And the strange thing about this garment is that he used various pieces of cloth. It's not as if he used the same cloth. He used different types of cloth. He used cotton, flax, you can use wool, rami, silk, denim, leather. And not only were there different textures, but they were also different colors. So this is what Joseph did, uh, J Jacob did for Joseph. But he had to ma match, you know. However you do the robe or tunic, it had to be, it had to match because it's a, it's a uh, symbol of authority, a symbol of favor, a symbol of God's, I mean, Jacob's blessing on Joseph. So it had to match. It had to be beautiful. So the coat of many colors was beautiful. It's a symbol of favor. It's a symbol of the love of his father for him. It's, when he wears it, it's a symbol of privilege and honor. It was a gift from his father. It shows that Joseph was covered by the favor and blessing and authority of God. Who else got a robe 
Do you remember a New Testament story where somebody got a robe? The prodigal son. When he came back, the father put a robe of righteousness on him. So it's again, a robe speaks of covering, protection. And I want you to know God has got you covered. He has prepared a robe for you. He has got you covered. Your father too has carefully stitched together a coat of many colours for you. It's a gift. It's a sign of favour. It's a sign of honour, privilege and blessing. It's a sign of authority for you. Now, Jacob knew how to give that to his son whom he loved. I want you to hear what Jesus says about you. Matthew 7 verse 11 says this, So if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So you know your Father in heaven wants to give you good things. He wants to bless you. He wants to honour you. He wants to promote you. He wants to single you out. He wants to make a difference in your life. So sometimes we have so many problems. Sometimes we lose a job. After many years of serving in that job. And we wonder why? Why? I've done so well. Sometimes we lose a loved one. Sometimes we lose forever. Sometimes it's a lover. We have a lover and we lose them and we wonder why. Why this lover, then the next lover, and another lover, and it doesn't work. Or one marriage, and it breaks another marriage. doesn't work. It's heartache after heartache. Pain after pain. Why can't I not find the right person? Why can't I fall in love with the right person? Why must my heart be broken over and over again? Then I love again and I break again. I want you to know that is a part of the cloth that God is putting together for your coat. I was born in this family. I was unhappy and I had some issues. God, I cannot understand. Then, at work, I mean, and then I had to live with another family. I had to go and live with my in-laws. But some people, not even in-laws. They had, while they're studying, they had to go and live with somebody. And you wonder why God took you into a different environment. A different place, you know. And then you get married, you have to stay with your in-laws. Again, why? God, I have to go through all this difficult. It's very painful. I want to have space for myself. Some had to live overseas. Not in the country, they had to go. Some had to live alone. They had to go through the valley of loneliness. You know, they went through that for some time. Some had to live under instructions of others, like a slave. Like a slave. When you look at Joseph's life, you see that. First he's with his father and brothers. Then he's in a pit with no water. Why no water? He cannot drink. And it wasn't one, two days and he was in the pit. If you read the story carefully, he was there for some time. Very painful, very long. Then he's sold to the Midianites. Different culture, different environment. What are you trying to do to me, Lord? Then he's sold as a slave. Now another house, the Roman envy. You know who Potiphar is? If you do some study on Potiphar, he was actually head of the secret service for Pharaoh. He was a very, he was a top uh, military officer, head of the secret service for Pharaoh. All this service, uh, bodyguards for Pharaoh was, Potiphar was in charge. So he was a very powerful person. And he had to function under the instructions of Potiphar, do this, do that. And whatever goes wrong in the house, you're in trouble. You're in trouble, Joseph. I don't have any management skills. I didn't go for MBA, Master's in Business Administration. But you're asking me to be in charge of the whole house. God, what, what are you doing in my life? I'm here a slave, I'm in a different culture, I'm going to learn a different language. First the Midianites, then the, uh, you know, uh, the Egyptians. I have to learn their language. Then I have to get adapted to their culture. What are you doing, Lord, in my life? But the Bible says the Lord was with him. The Lord is with you. Whatever you're going through, the Lord is with you. Start looking at it the way Joseph looked at it. In your family, people look to you. They look to you and say, you are have to help out. There's a problem, you are the answer. God, why do you have to be the center? Why can't it be somebody? else. In Joseph's life, he was in prison, they looked to him, you are responsible. Potiphar's house, you are responsible. Both in the field and in the home. You read the scriptures, it says that. In Potiphar's house too, Joseph was responsible. But we wonder why. At work, oh, you are responsible. You got to do it. If you don't do it, it's going to be a problem. You carry the bulk. People look to you. 
If anything goes wrong, they hold you responsible. They say, you should have done this. But you find that you're doing so much, and yet they want more. What you do is not enough. They want more. I want to suggest to you it's not them. It is the Lord your God behind them that is doing it. It is your Lord. Sometimes say, you know, you have to even clean the garbage. I say, Lord, what has garbage got to do with my training? What's garbage got to do with my cloak of many colors? You know, um, you work as a secretary. I don't know what type of jobs you've had in your life, but I've had many jobs. I've been a tally clerk, I've been dispatch, I've been driver, I've been many jobs, you know. And you wonder, what has that got to do with lawyering? What has that got to do with, you know, uh, God training you? So some has worked as secretary, dispatch, tally clerk, been a tuition teacher. Yes, I've done that. Yeah, <laughs> some of you have too. Driving instructor, have you done that? Teaching people to drive. Um, legal clerk, driver. And then you get falsely accused. Have you ever got falsely accused? We get very angry, you know, how can I have been serving God faithfully? How dare you falsely accuse me? Then you get charged. All this while the Lord is with you. You get convicted. That's serious, right? By then, people give up on you. They say, no way God can be on you. You know? You go through the stages and you stay in prison for a long time. Some financially, they invest here, they get into trouble. They don't know what happened. Invest here a lot. Then they end up, oh my God, I'm facing bankruptcy. I'm, 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 I'm in this state. I'm going to go. They have, it's financial prison, imprisonment. I want you to know that God has a hand in it all. In it all. Then the problem with a house, a problem with a car, the problem with a father or mother, wife, children, friends. Must I be the person to do it all? What types of clothes must be put and stitched together? We do not know. He is the potter. We are the clay. God stitches together all types of fabric. And all kinds of colour, not one colour. That's why you look at some other people, you will find that they only have one facet, one life. They may not be a Christian. They have one life and the life they lead and they're very happy and they die. But a Christian who knows God is multifaceted. He is the salt and the light. He begins to preach, he begins to sing, he begins to dance, he begins to lead. He be he's doing so many ushering. He's praying, he's a speaker, he's doing everything. He and she, I mean. That is what God is doing with Joseph. So you find Joseph is being taught so many things. And even when he becomes prime minister, his name is changed to Belshazzar. And he's marrying Pharaoh's daughter. And he's got to learn a new culture, the aristocratic way of life. He has to run a nation. Do you know how to run a nation? You've been in prison all this while. But God had given him a coat of many colors. It is symbolic speaking of the life that we lead. Speaking of the life that we need. You know, the colours I suggest to you, the experiences I suggest to you is the type of cloth that is sewn together. The colours is something else. The colours deal with talents. It deals with your abilities. So sometimes when you check your life, you say, God, why did you make me a scout? You know, so I did all these scouting activities. Then why did you make me a band? You joined a band. You started learning music. And in the band, you have to play various instruments. Does it help you? The lyre, the flute, the, the you know, you, you cannot see the end. You do not know what God is preparing you for. Then you do martial arts. Martial arts also you do different types, dang sudo, karate, or you join a church and then you become a cell group leader, a worship leader, a Sunday school van driver. You cook, you clean, you usher, you sing, you play, you dance, you speak. Oh, intelligence! God says you gotta have. Intelligence. So it makes you study, it makes you play games, all kinds of games, football, hockey. Table. You say one game, very few people play all kinds of games. But God requires all kinds of games. I want to suggest to you, He makes you do all that. If you look at your life, you'll begin to see glimpses of it, patches of it. That He suddenly takes you to different, different things and He tries to make you do different, different things. God makes you a prefect, he lead, debating, and all kinds. So these are the different, different colors that this coat has. But who is stitching it together? Jacob is stitching it for Joseph. God is stitching your life together. Your life together. 
God has stitched a coat specifically for you. So don't look at the other person's coat. Look at your coat. It is specific for you. Different types of cloth, different colors. Every part of your life, every experience in your life is preparing you for your destiny, for the purpose you have on earth. And yesterday when God dropped that thought into my heart, He told me, the story is not over. I want to know the story is not over for you too. The story is not over yet. If you looked at Joseph when he was thrown into prison, you would think the story is over. You know, I told God, yeah, that was a nasty thing you did. <laughs> you know, I was having a joke with God because the dream that he had, he interpreted the dream and he told, don't forget me when you go out. And the guy goes out and forgets him. <laughs> I said, you gave him a, you lifted him up, a hope and all that, I'm going to come out and suddenly he's forgotten again. <laughs> you know, for years. It's amazing, but God is training the man. God is training you. So if you look at Joseph's life, you will say, he trained him in betrayal. Have you been betrayed? By a close friend, by a loved one? Have you been betrayed? Joseph has been betrayed. In how it feels to be betrayed. How it feels to be sold. How it feels to be thrown in the pit and left for dead. Have you experienced that? To be thrown in the coal, without any form of income, facing the hole. God is training you. God is training you. If only we can see life like that, how much more powerful we will become. How much confidence we will have in what God is doing in our lives. We will ride above the circumstances. You know, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces, you know. Then Joseph had to learn to be a slave. Have you ever learned to be a slave? You know what a slave is? A slave got no choice, have to do. When the master gets up, you get up. In fact, you get up earlier than the master. If the master decides to sleep late, you sleep late. I had a tinge of it, I want to tell you, for nine months. A tinge of it when I want to work for somebody. And that person was strict. I mean, he treated me like that. I was a nobody, you know, in the environment. So I get up before he gets up. He gets up very early. I get up very early. And he sleeps whenever he wants. Wash his car, do everything. Wonder why would God take me after becoming school captain in La Salle? You go down here and you go through that experience. It's a devastating, but it's another piece of the cloth. He is training you. He is training me. Some person might be sent to Sabah or sent to some Ulu place for years to, to be there alone. Or you may go for, you know, on a ship, just, just there. I think, God, oh, why? Is this my life? But there is a plan. There is a purpose. God is with you during that time. Have you ever been sold out? Somebody sold you like a piece of property. Joseph experienced that. Have you ever been put in charge of an area or job or a function that you feel overwhelmed? I cannot handle it. Joseph was put in that position. He was not given a choice. When there, 40 percent, now you're in charge. You have to deal with it. And the success depends on you. Same thing with the jailer. The chief jailer said, you're in charge. You are responsible. If any problem here, we'll catch you. Because they can then rest. You know, it wasn't for Joseph that he was doing it. He was doing it for himself, for the benefit. Have you ever been in that position? Have you ever had a problem with a woman? Joseph had a problem with a woman, <laughs> you know. So he had that difficulty. He had that issue. He had to deal with it. And sometimes we too have to deal. Have you had a problem with a man? You have to deal with it. It is part of that coat of many colors, a part of that fabric. Were you falsely accused? Have you ever been falsely accused? Have you been tried? Some of us may be falsely accused but never tried. Some have gone to trials. Some have been convicted. Some have been imprisoned. Prison speaks about taking away all your liberties. Now, being in prison means I have no liberty. I know freedom. I cannot get up when I want. I cannot sleep when I want. I cannot eat when I want. And I cannot go anywhere I want. You're confined to a place. It's one of the worst things to be. That's why Jesus said, I came to set the prisoners free. Some of us are in prisons of our own making. Some of us are in prisons or emotional prisons. Some of us are in bondage because we cannot forgive. So we put ourselves in prisons. You know, a person who cannot forgive is in a prison. Let me tell you. You may think that you're out, but you're in. If you cannot forgive, you are imprisoned by that effect. And look at Joseph. 
Did he not forgive his brothers? His heart was always that. No bitterness. I will forgive. So he could say at the end of the day, and I hope you will be able to say, you may have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It is good for me that I should go through this. It is good for me that I have this problem. It is good for me that I'm lonely. It is good for me that I am made responsible. It is good for me. Because you may mean it for different reasons, but God always means it for good. For good, because the story is not over. Or you can say, like in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together to good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So every cloth, every experience in my life has been stitched together for good. For good. That is God's gift for you. Do not lose faith. Have faith in your God. If you who are evil, if you men who have, and, and women who have all kinds of desires know what is good to give to your children, how much more your heavenly Father Believe me when I tell you, God loves you so very much. And He has stitched this coat of many colors for you. It's a coat of honor. Wear it with honor. The life that you have led, wear it. You know, wear the favor of God. Wear it with dignity. Because it's a coat He stitched. It is God who stitched it. You know, yesterday I heard a message, amazing message by a Rabbi Friedman. Now, the, I, I'm listening to what, what the uh, Jews talk about their Torah. I just, I just dropped this because it's beautiful. He says this. You know, some people say, I got to be like the pastor. I got to be holy and good. I'm not saying the pastor is, uh, but I'm saying that people presume that the pastor is a different level. You know? Like D. Jake says, they think I'm a god. But he says, I'm not. I'm human. I have all my failures. But this rabbi says that. He says, listen, everybody has got a different calling. You can expect the general who looks at maps and gives direction to be well suited, to be shining, shoes to be shining, to be perfect. There's no reason why you shouldn't be. But you cannot expect the soldiers in the trenches to not have their boots dirty and their clothes messed up. So if you are in the trenches doing the will of God, fighting the fight, because that's what you have to do, we fight the battle. Then he said, don't worry so much about your dirty shoes. Don't worry so much about your crumpled garments. It's amazing. It's amazing because all things will work together for good. So God has placed us in different positions in our life for a particular purpose. Focus on what God has placed before you and do it with all your heart. Do it with all your heart. The secret with Joseph is he kept exercising his gifts no matter what. No matter what circumstances he was, he didn't let it get. He didn't let, let him get it down. He's all the reasons. Huh? You know, a lot of people who are born in a, a, a bad family, or I say bad family, or may not have been born into a good family, or had abuse, or was shifted from one house to another. They say today's term, they have been traumatized. They need inner healing. Have you heard these terms? They have, they are, they're having difficulty coping with life. Joseph was put in a situation where his own brothers threw him into a pit and he was left to die. Reuben is trying to save him, cannot. Then Judah said, let's sell them when the Midianites come. And it took some time for them to come. He sold to a group, forgotten forever, cannot be with his father, friends. He may have had a girlfriend at the time, we do not know. Missed everything. And he can be killed. Doesn't he have bitterness? How can God, you put me in this type of family? How can God, I suffer this? Did he? No, he did have that. He tried to be a blessing wherever he went. So when he went to Potiphar's house, he immediately was a blessing. Then he could have said, God, you didn't come through to me. Why should I abide by your rules? He could have taken, no, he said, I will not sin against God. Oh, my master, what a man. What a man. I mean, God is not coming through for you, J J uh, Joseph. Wake up, man. Wake up, call. Is he coming through? This deal you did fail. You're being sold. You're now a slave. Any prosperity goes to your master. What are you getting? Zero. Then he gets accused. I will stand up for what is right, as always. That's what Joseph is. A man who does what is right. 
and I will not conspire with you, Potiphar's wife, even though I would enjoy it. I will not. To the extent he lost his garment, you know, he pulled his garment. And then she said, you tried to rape me. Falsely accused. She looked to God. God, I stood up for what is right. I did the righteous thing. Why aren't you protecting me? Where is my protection? No. He is sent into prison. He's accused, no defense. Nobody is defending. He probably argued the best he could. But they said, sorry, we don't believe you. Go to prison. And he spends the rest of his life, that period of his life in prison. And many years. It's not one, two days. He goes, where is your God, Joseph? If I was you, I will curse him to his face and live my life the way I want to. That's what Job's wife told him. Where is your God? Where is your God, Michael? Where is your God, Iowa? Where is your God, Robert? Where is your God, Anthony? Where is your God? Is he coming through for you? But Joseph said, no. I will not lose faith in my God. And the Lord was with him when he went into the prison. And what did Joseph do? He began to minister to the prisoners around. He began to bless them. He began to help the jailer. He was the salt and light no matter where because there was no bitterness in him. He forgave everybody who offended him. He longed to see his brothers and father again. Joseph, you want to be nuts? No, I miss them. And when they came, how happy he was. He wept. He's so happy to see them. Where's the bitterness? Where's the inner healing you need? Where's all the things that we all say? These people couldn't speak with him peacefully. They couldn't address him, but he was, no. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So I take it God used you. It wasn't you. That's his thinking. That's the thinking. And he blessed. And he blessed them. And he blessed them. That is the heart of Joseph. That should be our heart too. That should be our heart too. So don't forget the secret that brought Joseph to this end, that he, the beautiful end that he had at the end, was that he kept practicing the gift. He never lost sight of God. He kept his focus on God. Always keep your focus. Do not do what Peter did. Peter kept his focus on Jesus for a while and then changed his focus to the circumstances and he began to sink. Keep your focus on God. This message is for you. Because 2017, and God wants to tell you, I've got you covered. I have made a robe for you. And this robe covers you. Wear it. Praise me for it. Thank me for it. Because others may mean it evil for you, but I mean good. All things work together for good. For you. For you. All things. Just do justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly, humbly before me. Apart from giving him a coat. So Jacob, his earthly father, gives him a coat. God, his heavenly father, gives him a dream. Gives him a dream. You know, and um, we will do the dream when the next time I get a chance to share. But I want you to know that God will then bless you. God will bless you. When you become faithful, when you show God that you want to honor Him, that you show God that He is the most important, that the other things in life is not, God begins to mark that person. And God marks you. And then God begins to change the circumstances around your life. So you may lose your job, but you get three better ones. Then you may lose this one, and then you may find you get another one. But that are the different stages in your life. So you may experience all these things but remember that behind it all is your lord god whatever coat was made for jesus christ he wore it he wore it lord your will be done not mine but your will be done so when you look at your life look at it in that context lord i thank you i thank you no matter what comes my way i know my god will see me True, my God has got me covered. My God is all I need. I want you to know you're here today. I close with this. You're here today because God has a plan that He hasn't finished with you. There is a purpose, there is a destiny He hasn't finished. You know, when God formed you, when God planned you, 
He planned his coat. He already structured what he wants in your lifestyle. And oftentimes, we cannot see what God has planned. So we need prophecies. But somebody will tell you, hey, I see uh, this boy has got a good future. Have you heard that? I think this guy's going to make a great businessman. You've heard that, no? People say that. It's easy to say after the person has been a hero. So you look at Donald Trump and say, I knew that Donald Trump would be the president of America. Or Obama, because he was chairman of law society in Harvard. So I knew he would be president of America. Now you can say. But at that time, you couldn't say it because you can't see it. But I want you to know somebody else who sees. There's somebody else who knows that you have a destiny, that God has planned a purpose for your life. And that is the devil. That is the demonic forces. They know and they have had experience for thousands of years dealing with human beings. So then they tailor, they plan to deceive you, to stop you, to, to, to uh, prevent you from achieving the destiny or the plan that God has. But you know, he said, nothing, no weapon formed against you can prosper. You know that. End of the day, God will triumph. But bear this in mind that Moses had a tremendous destiny. You know the destiny, right? Because we know the story now. We have gone so many thousand years ahead. But when Moses was born, he had a destiny. And what did the devil do? He tried to kill. You know, we will be offended if somebody tries to kill a baby. The guy hasn't, cannot defend himself. He hasn't stood up yet. But the devil doesn't play fair. When the devil knows that there is a destiny in your life, that God is going to use you for a purpose, he begins to attack you. Even as a baby, he will attack you. So sometimes in your life, you find a lot of instances happen. You don't understand, especially when you were younger. So many instances. He's trying to destroy. He's trying to create a havoc. Because he sees the destiny. God sees the destiny in your life. He sees that this person has a destiny. That's why he attacked Joseph. He did it with Jesus. He saw Jesus had, he killed the babies. Because he wants to stop. He wants to stop that purpose. But we know he cannot. Because God will establish what he intended. Samson, he tried to do it by bringing Delilah in. But Samson fulfilled the will of God in his life by bringing the temple down. He just fulfilled it while he was blind. He could have fulfilled it with all his eyes, with a great life, with the abundant life. So bear that in mind when the attacks come. Recognize that it's because there's a destiny in your life. God has called you for a purpose. He has planned. He is not a God of accidents. He's got a divine plan for each and every one of you. And because you haven't finished that plan, you're still on earth. If you're finished, time is up. Some of us had near business, you know, some accidents. Some of us have died and had to come back. You know, so you have that. But if you have that experience, you know, God, you have not finished with me. There is something I must do. And your will must come to pass. So we want to be encouraged with that fact. All right? So be encouraged that there is a plan. There is a destiny for your life. It's not over. Regardless of the circumstance, you may be in your prison now. And nobody knows you. You're forgotten and all. But all the talents, everything that God has built is there waiting for that one hour with Pharaoh. For that one hour with an interviewer, for that one hour in a court of law, for that one hour in a business meeting that will change your life forever. And that's God. That one event changes you forever and you're propelled to the international arena. Joseph's life will never be the same again once he walks out of prison into the presence of Pharaoh. David's life will never be the same again once he walked out of the desert and brought down Goliath. Daniel's life will never be the same once you... Everybody, Moses' life will never be the same again once he walked into Pharaoh's court to say, let my people go. That's how God changes. God does that. Okay, So wait for your moment. Don't lose heart. Don't be tired of doing good. For a little bit more, a bit more endurance and your reward and your destiny is here. The will of God will be done. So God bless you. This is the word of God for this morning.